And most of it, if things are going well, it'll be a handful of times a week that we get triggered and overextend. Yeah. Yeah. However, someone that's really toxic knows how to keep you off balance. They know how to throw more triggers your way and keep you in your overextended. What might trigger me into what you could call maladaptive or we prefer to call overextended behaviors? And if you have a cluster of overextended behaviors, if it's happening a lot, yeah, that's when you're heading for territory that will damage your relationships. When we're in a relationship with someone who's toxic, it seems like they look specifically for the trigger points in order to make us overextend. But what you're bringing up is the unfortunate reality. Some people are quite skilled in the dark arts of knowing how to trigger other people deliberately because it gives them some sort of sense of control. Try to create paranoia in order to create social isolation. Mm -hmm. In other words, your friend there isn't really a friend. They're jealous. They're taking advantage of you. Mm. Or your parents, if they really wanted you to succeed, they do things a bit differently. Mm. And usually there's some element of truth in it. However, yeah. the goal is to create the isolation because when we've got no friends, then all of a sudden we're, well, stuck in a one-person cult. People get quite confused because the relationship fails. They feel that they failed. But I feel a relationship with a toxic person was designed for failure as the mm. goal wasn't mutual success, the goal was extraction of resources for as long as possible and then discard and move on to the next supply. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm very excited to show you something very special today. I'm here with Stuart Desson, who is the CEO and founder of Lumina Learning. Lumina is a psychometrics model that I've started using with my clients. I've used it with myself and I found it's been illuminating to understand personality, my personality, some strengths I have, but also some weaknesses I had that have been exploited by toxic people in the past. This has made it easier for me to understand what I can dial up in order to be safer when I can dial down in order to avoid losing control as much and avoid getting what we call overextended. Mm -hmm. For me, this has been fascinating. I think you're really going to enjoy using the model. Uh, and there's a, a free app called Lumina Splash. There is, yeah. That I recommend you you download. Uh, that will make a lot of this uh, this conversation more, more insightful. And then we can discuss uh, further on the channel how to do the full portrait. So first of all, Stuart Essen, thank you for having me and welcome to the channel. I'm delighted to be here. Really, really looking forward to what we might discuss. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it's. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. As we know, there's a lot of content out there that talks about narcissism. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, content that's meant to be helpful, but there's also a lot of noise, a lot of confusion. People are not mm -hmm. always completely clear with what narcissism is, what narcissists are. And I think having a rigorous and structured approach helps reduce the noise, reduce the confusion. And I think the more targeted conversations are, the more helpful they get to be, and the more tangible it is so we can perhaps move out of toxic situations and avoid falling back into them again in the future. So, based on this, uh, perhaps, Stuart, would you be able to give us a quick rundown of the model that you use, that you've created? Yeah, thank you. So, the model I've created, Luminous Spark, is a model for looking at who we are, our way of being, and it helps us look at it when things are going well, when we're using our qualities effectively. Um, it also helps us look at, as you mentioned earlier, what, what am I dialing up to be more effective in this situation? Or maybe what am I pulling back on to make myself safer, depending on who's around me. But importantly, it also looks at what might I overextend? What might trigger me into what you could call maladaptive or we prefer to call overextended behaviours? And if you have a cluster of overextended behaviours, if it's happening a lot, yeah, that's when you're heading for territory that will damage your relationships um, at work. So the Luminous Bart model is actually based on a theory called the Big Five. The Big Five is a um, it's a theory that's grown really over the last 30 years and it's based on looking at um, people's personalities, measuring them, quantifying them and correlating everything. There's been like tons and tons of research studies to try and figure out 
what's really going on in in the data and there are five factors so i can would you like me to run through it would that be of interest uh, just before we do that, could you yeah. explain what overextension is? And then I think when you run through it, it's going to make a lot more sense. Okay, so so my definition of overextension is I have a personality, I have a preferred way of being, and when things are going well, that's good. But you might say something that triggers me. Um, it might cause me to think back to a previous circumstance or there may be a particular belief I've got. But if something triggers me, I might think I'm being really candid and clear and direct with you but actually i start to become a bit aggressive a little bit in your face so something's triggered me into that i might not even realize it's happening you might feel it yeah so we usually look at what's the trigger point that causes me to overextend and of course there's quite a skill to noticing when you're doing it which requires a lot of self-awareness and there's quite a skill to then once you've noticed figuring out what you might do about it do you just let it run its course or have you got techniques for getting yourself back if you like to equilibrium yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and something i've i've certainly noticed and uh, i'm sure a lot of viewers have noticed is when we're in a relationship with someone who's toxic it seems like they look specifically for the trigger points in order to make us overextend yeah. and gain gain power momentum control would that make any sense it does make sense so so normally when i'm applying this framework in the workplace i'm trying to help people realize when they do it themselves based on the theory that they probably don't want to because it's most people don't like doing it most of the time and it's not effective but what you're bringing up is the unfortunate reality some people are quite skilled in the dark arts of knowing how to trigger other people deliberately because it gives them some sort of sense of control um so it can be extremely helpful for yourself to know when other people, to be able to see when other people are doing this to you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And something I've, I've noticed, and it's been very helpful to have the Lumina model for me to be able to put words onto things I'd, mm. I'd noticed, picked up on, but I couldn't quite explain. Something I noticed, and this is my, my take on it, is generally we try to avoid overextending ourselves and we try mm. to avoid other people overextending because it sort of feels a bit like chaos, a bit dangerous. It's like yes. we're all on autopilot. So we try to tone this down. Now, I remember seeing toxic people, people who turned out to be toxic, faking overextension in order to create the chaos. And all of a sudden when they get called out, they calm down immediately with a smirk. Yeah, And that to me has been very unsettling because i'd assume that there was really a problem but they were just faking it but they were generating the overextension in others which was uh, authentic overextension so authentic trying to manage yeah, so, uh, danger. other people's behavior is an authentic response i yeah. think is what you're saying and they can be triggered and be authentically overextended but what you're saying is the person that's initiated it the toxic person yeah uh may this main fact be a manipulation you exactly know, they, they've learned that uh if they if you like role play or mask those behaviors make it appear that's what happened they'll get the response from other people exactly yeah and that that seems to give them power uh mm -hmm. enjoyment amusement mm -hmm. uh also probably supply and attention it's one of the things they they look for yes and how, how does it work when we're overextending because uh let's say someone or let's say there's some some conflict with someone and we're overextending it seems to me we often try to reduce the the conflict we try to come to a place of uh, understanding and agreement and closure is that sort of how how it works well i think if 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 i'm if i'm triggered into an overextension um so let's say my my imagination is is pretty active and i'm triggered into for some reason, I'm compulsively throwing in too many ideas and maybe confusing with you too many ideas. Um, at some level, that will, in a normal person, that will run its course. I'm not going to do it all day, all the time. There'll be some awareness at some point. I'll get some feedback that I'm overdoing it, and I'll realise, and it will it will subside. Yeah. If I'm self-aware, I can look back at the trigger point. What you're suggesting, though, is if someone is like. Um, acting up and pretending to be overextended 
they're not really overextended um so what what they are is that they're, they're they're role-playing it they're faking it they're inauthentically appearing like that so i might i might want to appear if i'm doing that i could appear aggressive and deliberately turn on my aggression but if it's really just an act the overextension is something else i'm not even quite sure what it would be it's something a bit darker and a bit deeper. Yes, yeah. the, 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 the sense I have is, indeed, it's faking the situation that triggers everyone. So sometimes I liken it to a card mm. game where events happen, tension grows, and then normally we look for closure to reduce the tension to make sure we're on the same page because mm. misunderstandings happen. When somebody sort of trips us up to turn us, uh, to, to create the overextension, all of a sudden they can flip back to pretending nothing happened. And that can be really disturbing. Yes. You know, where we think we need a bit of closure to be able to move on and make sure we're on the same page, but they pretend nothing happened. So we don't get the closure, but then all of a sudden they get upset again. We're not sure why. We end up walking on eggshells all the time. And that can be really, really unsettling. Yeah. I mean, um, just one uh, practical example where I've experienced something like this many, many years ago is a, uh, a, a, a perching director one of their techniques was to be really aggressive with the person they were negotiating with and they'd choose the moment for doing it and really really confront them and be unpleasant yeah but actually it was an act they weren't really feeling aggressive they just it was a technique they were yeah. using but most people would respond oh my god i'm being aggressed some people would i need to make the peace now maybe i need to compromise and then the the manipulation would work yes yeah but the really smart thing to do um and partly what i'm about with luminous spark is helping people realize who they are hopefully not want to do the dysfunctional thing but if someone is doing that to you to give you some tools for realizing when that's happening for mm -hmm. noticing when that's happening so you don't take the bait so one part of not overextending is realizing when someone is trying to trigger you yeah. and finding a way to not let them trigger you yeah absolutely yeah and I, I, th uh, you know, what, what, what I observe is the, the different ways different people are triggered. And I mm -hmm. think this is sort of what, what overlaps with the different uh, aspects of the, the, the big five, different types of personality. Yes. If we're aware of the different ways we can be triggered, it's easy mm. to be aware of when we are being triggered. And knowing that when someone's acting unreasonable, some of us would just shrug our shoulders and say, the, this person's a lunatic. So yeah. I don't care if they're getting upset. I'm just walking away. And some people will wonder if they did something wrong and they will try to mend the situation. Yes. And I think narcissists are sort of on the lookout for people who are willing to try to mend a situation instead of just walk away. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And um, some organizations that have cult-like properties will deliberately recruit people that fit that mold yes. because they're more manipulable in their, in their organizations. Yes. And... Uh, people that don't have those trigger points will simply just avoid those organizations they, they'll 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 sense it at 20 paces yeah that makes a lot of sense so being aware of who you are and your personality when things are going well is incredibly useful being aware of what triggers you as you have suggested is also incredibly useful so for example for real for me i'm i'm one thing that can trigger me is avoiding conflict i want i want us to to get on um i i, I want if there's an argument brewing, I will normally want to keep it smoothed. That's part of Stuart's pattern. So I'd call that a, an overextension of my people focus. Yes. I want to be nice and empathetic and so on. Um, if I'm aware of that and if I'm aware of the things that trigger me, I'm more likely to notice if someone's doing it to me. And that's incredibly helpful. Yes, I've, I've noticed the same yeah. thing also dislike and conflict sometimes conflict of course is is necessary mm. but realizing what the symptoms are that we're overextending has been incredibly helpful for me just to rationalize and think you know i see that i'm doing the thing that i expect to be doing when i'm getting triggered so mm. i know i'm getting triggered i can see what the trigger is and then i can calm myself down a bit yeah rationalize i find the logic is very important for that mm. uh, i think it's actually one thing i try to do on this channel is to show the mental patterns that help make sense to help realize when things are unreasonable or illogical mm -hmm. or manipulative so that rationally we can understand so that it's it's easier to not get manipulated emotionally yeah so if i, if I give you my take on that i mean i i, I 
benefit from being coached and uh, it's not uncommon uh, for my coach to help me see actually you're going into your pleasing drama here Mm -hmm. Um, think about this situation think it through actually there is a legitimate conflict here actually some of the conflict may in fact be helpful yes Um, so rather than run run from it engage that opposite bit of me which in in lumen would be like my outcome focus my logic my ability to be direct engage that often that can be constructive and helpful but it takes an effort i've got to dial it up yes i've got to dial it up now um if i think the other person is doing it as a manipulation yeah maybe that's not the best approach yeah yes then it depends Uh, a big difference i see is when it's um let's say normal healthy people yeah we want to solve the problem Mm. we want to to move things forward we want to 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 solve the conflict and it seems that the toxic people and something i uh, i I picked up on a few times want to stay in the conflict situation they're okay with it they're okay living with without the closure, without moving on, without finding an agreement. So mm. it can sort of be that we're, we look, well, we're making the assumption that they want to find some kind of solution, uh, but in reality it's not the case. In reality we're not seeing that. Yeah, so most of us want to find a solution. Most of us, it's pretty normal not to want to be in your, living in your overextended, Yeah. Uh, most of us, if things are going well, it'll be a handful of times a week that we get triggered and overextend. Yeah. Yeah. However, someone that's really toxic knows how to keep you off balance. They know how to throw more triggers your way and keep you in your overextended. Some organisations live on keeping everybody in their overextended when you're overextended you are highly manipulatable <laughs> you will you will people can get you to do stuff that you wouldn't normally do yeah and that's the that's the horror and the dysfunction of that manipulation yeah i find it it's interesting when it comes to conflicting goals because we'd mm-hmm. assume that the goal of, a, of an organization is to be successful and also profitable yes and the best way to do that is to help people thrive yeah and sometimes another goal is to squeeze people as much as possible Mm. even if it costs them an absolute fortune Mm. and uh, to me it's just conflicting goals in the same way we'd assume in a relationship the goal is to foster a relationship that's beneficial for everyone where both people thrive but for some people the goal is to squeeze the other person as much as possible and uh as a realization i had when it comes to relationships it's not so much a relationship with a narcissist fails it's more that it was designed to fail Mm. because the main goal was not for it to succeed the main goal was to extract as much energy from the other person as possible i liken it to a vampire trying to extract the 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 blood the life force from the person and when they're empty then they just get discarded because they they sort of broke their toy toys broken move on to the next one Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've experienced this in a, in a work context. So you ha- get leaders that will do that uh, to their staff. In my personal experience, the best thing to do when you realise what's going on is to quit. <laughs> yes. Yeah? If that's an option, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. You just get away from it because you're not going to fix them. Yeah. Um, what else would I say? I mean, I think my take on this is I come to it like we do leadership development here at Lumina Learning and we want to help leaders be more authentic and we want to help leaders not operate out of their overextended and not work on triggering triggering people you know that's really what we're what we're all about Um, and helping people realize what's going on there is a sort of a a a lesser um, version of what you're talking about that leaders often engage in they may might not be completely narcissistic but they may feel under pressure um, as leaders and they may use some of the techniques that you're outlining without being fully narcissistic just to get people as they think working harder to push them more i think that's quite common in businesses um to to create an environment where there's where there's fear um and to and to manipulate people to sort of work harder out of that fear and part of what i'm about in luminary is going beyond that so that people at work are not being motivated by fear 
to find a way where they, they're in touch with their purpose, yeah. that's a, a sort of a more noble way of doing it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd actually like at one point like to touch on the the outcome focus part, but I think it could be helpful mm-hmm. uh, to go back to the 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 big five part and the different yes. archetypes, and perhaps give us an overview of what they are, and then also have an overview of what are the typical overextension traits of each of them. Okay, so I'll I'll go through it using the um, ocean anachronism. So um, O is for openness. So in Lumina. Uh, and I'll relate it to myself. I'm high on what we call big picture thinking. I'm full of good ideas. I like a concept, a model. This conversation is stimulating. The opposite is being down to earth. That's not so much me, but um, some people are sensible, cautious, evidence-based, and they want to check everything. Okay? Now, both of those can become dysfunctional. My big picture thinking can go into sort of not in touch with reality or distorting reality to fit my vision so if i'm overdoing it that's um that's where i might go the down to earth if we overdo it we're more likely to be so cautious that we don't move um in what you were talking about earlier it's more likely that the narcissistic leader is to it will be in the overextended big picture thinking and the people that they attract are are sort of frozen in the headlights in the overextended down Mm. to earth if i was to generalize so that's the first factor that's the o the C is conscientiousness, and in Lumina, we call that discipline-driven. So if I have a lot of discipline, I'm ordered, I'm structured, I'm clear on the goal, I'm focused. The opposite, we would call that inspiration-driven. Seize the moment, go with the flow, be spontaneous. Personally, I'm, I have more at the inspiration-driven end of the spectrum. I'm entrepreneurial, I like to shake things up a bit. But I have learned that I need to be disciplined to get stuff done at work in my role as a CEO. So I need to make sure there's enough structure. Linking that to overextending and being dysfunctional, at the bottom, the discipline-driven overextended, we become something of a control freak. We use structure and process to box people in so they have to do everything exactly the way we want it yeah if i go to the other end the inspiration driven if we overextend here this is where we become impulsive like immune to risk we just don't see risk it's just not there so we'll take huge risks and not even know we're doing it and we'll break rules yeah so some of the behaviors you were talking about uh, being narcissistic would fit more with that higher end the inspiration driven approach to overdoing it when we can become somewhat impulsive and and not consider things fully Mm -hmm. that's the second bit yep yeah the next one is extroversion, which is a, a term that um, Jung actually coined in the, the 1920s, extroversion versus introversion, which most people can um, relate to. Actually, it's in common sort of conversation. If we're extroverted, I'm going to enjoy connecting with you and enthusing and uh, jazzing and we'll have some energy between us this will uplift me if i'm introverted i want to think through a bit more carefully what you said i want to choose my words carefully i may be a little bit more boundaried in expressing my emotions now in terms of being overextended if i overextend my extroversion i'm going to persuade you i'm going to overwhelm you (laughs) i'm going to throw so much emotion in that you can't resist the direction i want to take you in i can be overly persuasive too persuasive yeah if i overextend my introversion i retreat Mm -hmm. yeah i don't give don't disclose my emotions i sort of hide yeah and you don't really know what i'm thinking and what's going on so that's the third one Mm -hmm. if we go to the next one it's typically called agreeableness we call being highly agreeable being people focused i tend to be higher on this showing empathy a team player i want to get on with you now let's you know we want to enjoy this together and be supportive of each other and i want to be diplomatic and avoid any conflict the opposite outcome focused i want a result i'm going to be candid i'm going to speak my mind i've got a competitive spirit if i overplay my people focused which is something I'm prone to do. I'll become a people pleaser. I'll be too nice. Um, I, I might even show keep showing empathy when empathy is not appropriate, and that can become extremely tiring. Outcome focused. Um, I could become manipulative in my mind and just want the result. I can be 
overly direct other people will perceive it as uh, as rude and i could become a bit conniving in my logic and my thinking to figure everything out so i could become a bit machiavellian would be the the risk in terms of the patterns you highlighted um earlier if someone is uh narcissistic they're often looking for overextended people focused in others because they can be easier to manipulate around their empathy at least that's a possibility yeah yes and then the, the final one the fifth one um in the literature it's called being emotionally stable or neurotic i don't like that terminology so we use more humanistic terminology we talk about are you a reward reactor or a risk reactor it re- relates a bit to your brain chemistry so a reward reactor i'm confident i'm optimistic it's all going to be fine um i can calm things down um, I can smooth things, and I'm pretty resilient if there's a crisis going on, it doesn't show. The risk reactor, I feel a little bit more anxious, um, I, I sense my emotions more, that does mean I can jump on things and solve problems quicker, um, I might get triggered and get quite volatile, so the risk with um, risk reactors is I could get fiery, I could get volatile, I could get angry, that's a, that's, um, a possibility, and my inner dialogue often here can be more critical. So I might, you, it might look like I'm being angry and in your face, but actually the inner dialogue might be quite negative towards myself. So those dimensions are interesting because typically at work, it's often the risk reactor that's considered not so helpful. You know, often in the workplace, people don't want staff to be anxious and volatile and so on but when we talk about some of the dysfunctions that you're talking about like uh, narcissism it's sort of going to the extreme of being a, a reward reactor i'm an optimist it's going to work but really overextending it yeah and if you overextend it there like i'm um, i'm so optimistic there's no space for seeing that anything could go wrong mm-hmm. and i've got such confidence it can bring everybody with me, but it could be a false confidence. It might not be a confidence grounded in any sort of reality, but it could be quite persuasive. That's the risk. Yes. I, uh, it's something I've seen a lot is a lot of fake confidence that's not matched by actual facts mm. and living in a bubble. Mm. And and then a lot of resentment when people suddenly go, you know, you claim this to be the case, but mm. I'm not seeing anything. I remember one, one person whom I've uh, referred to as being the... Uh, the Maldivian con man, who claimed to be uh, the brains behind projects and brains behind this and that. And having tried to work with him for, for a few years, I saw he was incapable of delivering anything, nothing, mm. incapable of writing an email, incapable of doing a slideshow, incapable of doing anything on Excel, uh, just absolutely nothing. But he yeah. always claimed to be incredible uh, and just reality didn't match. And I saw, I've seen that with many Another person, uh, the the one who claims to be an architect, who wasn't qualified as an architect, had a lot of projects, none of which ever were actually produced. Mm. And uh, it turned out he didn't have a degree in architecture. It turned out he yeah. uh, he'd worked on things, but his genius ideas, no client ever ever purchased them. So he failed systematically to win projects. But in his mind, he was a genius. So he might be mm. right, but if he's the only person who believes he's a genius, it's not very helpful. The, the challenge is that these people often do persuade others they're a genius, even when they're not. You know? Yes. You know, and that's, that's, uh, that's really, really dangerous territory so you've got being confident you know not linked in any way to the facts but there's another point i'd like to bring up here which is what i would call your underlying persona versus your everyday so if my outer persona my everyday behavior is supreme confidence yeah you know that's one thing if underneath yeah I'm not really that confident, <laughs> yeah. So my inner confidence is not there. But if I don't want to you to know that, if I'm desperate to 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 not let you know that underneath, um, then I will actually puff up my outer behaviour even more. So some of the people that come over as supremely confident in their inner dialogue, they're not at all. But you'd never yes. guess it because they've devoted their life to puffing up that exterior confidence. Exactly, to, mm. to, to building up this fake persona. So normally when we get to know someone better, we realize there's more nuance to the image. Mm-hmm. And I think it's one of the things very unnerving with, with our well, quote-unquote narcissists, toxic people, mm-hmm. is when we try to look behind the persona, the mask, there's nothing really there. Yeah. And, and there's no real no That's real why narcissistic people are almost impossible to coach. 
Yes. Uh, with other dysfunctions, there at least can be a way in because coaching is often about helping you become more self-aware, let's be open about it, and then helping you work on a blind spot. But unfortunately, they're wired not to let you know their blind spots. So if they get a, even a sniff that you're going near what might be a real blind spot, every defense mechanism will come Absolutely. out to push you back. So they're pretty much uncoachable. Yes, but they, yeah. they consider they've got no blind spots. Mm. And if you claim they ha they have, you know, they're not 100% qualified at 100% of everything 100% of the time, mm. you know, which has a one in a million probability of happening, mm. then you're the problem and you become a target. Yeah. Something I mean, I recall many years ago coaching or attempting to coach someone, didn't really work, <laughs> in a bank. And um, they they did an assessment of their leadership skills and they were convinced that they were 100% full marks on literally every single competency that was possible and every single personality attribute yes. and no end of me explaining that that was like incredibly unlikely mm -hmm. yeah was uh, was going to go anywhere near denting their self-perception interestingly one good way in there is to say well if you're not going to listen to me why don't we find out what your colleagues and team think and get some sort of 360 that's normally a good way to try and get in in this particular case they know that's dangerous so <laughs> no we're not doing a 360 so that is nipped in the bud as well these are the patterns that we sometimes see that makes a yeah. lot of sense mm. I, I was thinking when you were talking before i hadn't thought about this but when you were talking about the different uh aspects and the yeah. the, the, the part of ocean it seems to me that there's some there's uh, there's some pattern where they overextend on some levels, but mm -hmm. then project the overextension onto others mm -hmm. uh, in terms where they will they will see the weaknesses that they have. They uh, yeah. accuse others of having those weaknesses. And I think there's also, if we have some level of uh, risk reactor, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, we... We, we can have some level of confidence and we also are aware that sometimes we may be we may go a little bit too far and yes. i think if they're able to get the foot in the door accuse us of doing exactly what they're doing we we get a blind spot where we stop looking at them we start looking internally they get to project everything onto us and if we don't dismiss them then it can be very dangerous because then mm. we well they basically start gaslighting us mm. uh when we're we're being reason you know reasonable by by pretty much anybody's standards they go you're too much of a people pleaser mm. or this person is trying to take advantage of you mm. or you were a little bit too tough there that wasn't necessary or you're a bit too rigid or you're a bit too flexible and it can be very unnerving if yeah. we assume that they're a reliable source of feedback to listen to someone who's simply trying to wind us up and saying whatever it takes to wind us up. So, so again, what's happening here, you're taking something that's part of the human condition that's relatively normal and then exploiting it and taking it to extremes. Yes. So, um, for example, you know, it, it could be that I'm um, a very enthusiastic person and that I know sometimes I, I steamroll the people to get my way. And maybe I just do that intermittently and it's overextended, um, but it's not the end of the world. And I might... If I'm looking at other people, I might be more sensitive when I see other people doing it because I know that I'm deep down inside, I know that I'm doing it. I might even offer it as feedback to other people. I think this is what you're doing. I'm really speaking to myself. Yes. So um, I remember doing uh, a, a, an exercise a number of times with a group where I encouraged them to give feedback to each other, but actually she could rec record who was giving which feedback to who. And at the end of the day, give it back to the person and say, have a look at all this feedback you've, you've given. What does it say about yourself? And it's, um, it's not uncommon for the feedback we give to actually be, say, more about us than other people. But what you're no. talking about is someone taking that to the nth degree and and giving that feedback to other people with a way of keeping them as we said earlier overextended off balance e effectively gaslighting them exactly um, and being completely really unwilling to really want to look at uh the, the true source of, yes. of, of it yep. the, the way it seems to me is that somehow i mean it feels like if, if there were a, a, a psychology academy for these people to learn to operate the way they do it'd be impressive mm. but it seems they're able to pick up on patterns of human behavior systematically hack them in order to get whatever they want and i think mm. when we understand the patterns how they can be hacked it's like having trojan horses we see what the vulnerabilities are so that we can recognize when it's happening 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so one way is when we start uh, doubting ourselves a lot. Mm. I think um, another thing is to see how the feedback is being offered. I remember, uh, so here's, here's one, one, well, one story, one, one tip. Talking with uh, a woman in Paris who claimed to be a therapist, turned out she wasn't a therapist at all. Mm -hmm. And she had a way of manipulating all of her clients by being condescending and pushy and aggressive and yeah. triggering them all the time. Mm. And she tried it with me by accusing me of doing something and saying, I could interpret that a certain way. Mm. And I, so there was the criticism, there was the rejection, there mm -hmm. was the, uh, the criticism on, based on my intentions. So saying, I could imagine that the worst possible interpretation is the only acceptable interpretation. It took me about three days to process this and think, well, the question is not so much that you could. The question is, are you assuming this is the case? Mm -hmm. Because if you are assuming it's the case, we need a very special conversation. And if you're not, you know, otherwise you're giving me the benefit of the doubt and we can work it out. But mm -hmm. her goal was not to dispel a misunderstanding. It was to trigger me in mm -hmm. order to get power over me and then invoice me for her time. Mm -hmm. That was, it was fascinating That's to observe. That's a good observe. business model. <laughs> not really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unethical and horrible yeah. for her highly profitable and I've mm. seen people who've been working with her for years who make no progress. Then they do a session with me, they make a lot of progress, and then she'd mm. panic because she was about to lose a client. But for her, for her cash flow, it was fantastic. Mm. But ethically, it's it's horrible. Yeah, it's ethically, ethically bankrupt. Yeah. Absolutely, morally bankrupt. I mean, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, is there an academy to, to learn all these horribly dysfunctional um, skills? And uh, I actually think there, there are a number of them, and they're called cults. <laughs> so mm. what often happens in a cult is that maybe the leader of the cult doesn't even realise. They might not consciously know what they're doing. They've learnt it from somewhere, but it sort of works. So maybe the behaviour of the, of the therapist you outlined, maybe they did know what they were doing, maybe not. Maybe mm -hmm. they just somehow learn that that sort of works to keep their clients and somehow they want to yes. get more money out of their clients. So, um, for example, um, a good friend and colleague of mine, um, Dr. Stephen Hassan, um, he used to be in, he was enrolled um, unethically into Scientology uh, quite quite some time oh, ago, yeah. many, many years ago. I know of him, yeah. Very, very yeah, interesting Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. And I've had a number of fantastic conversations with him. And he explained to me that he learned some really dysfunctional stuff, um, including how essentially to talk in a hypnotic way for a long period of time. Actually, sorry, I've got it wrong. It was the, it was the Moonies that he joined. It's the Scientologists that don't like him. So he's enrolled into the Moonies, and he learned from them a way of talking that was sort of hypnotic. You could talk for hours and put people into a sort of trance and then they would just start to go with the things you were saying. Yes. It, there wasn't a course on how to do it. They didn't say, here's the course on talking hypnotically to get people to do crazy stuff. Um, but because he'd had it done to him and, uh, and learnt it, he mm. sort of absorbed it and then did it back. And it wasn't until years later he realised that was, uh, you know, not a good thing to do. Yeah. yeah. I think it's easy to pick up on behaviours that work and just see that it's, uh, well, it's pattern recognition. Something yeah. does seem to work. Mm. And I'm, I'm curious, what would be the the typical triggers, let's say, that the different archetypes would have, the things that would trigger them into overextension? I mean, is there anything that usually stands out? Um, yeah, so let me think what would, what would, what could be a possible trigger. I mean, um, if I'm very people focused, you know, one one trigger would be um, making me think I'm the source of a conflict. Yeah. So if you can oh, say yes. something that can trigger me to go, no, 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 calm down, calm down. Yeah. 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 Um, so anything that could looks like a conflict's being triggered that makes me think it's my fault or makes me feel compelled to smooth it, that would be typically what would trigger somebody yeah. who was more people focused. The opposite outcome focused a trigger can be you know making me wrong yeah mm -hmm. if i think that you're blaming me for something or you're putting me down in some way then that can trigger me to become argumentative mm -hmm. and, and aggressive back towards you that so makes it's me the opposite yeah really. yeah it's interesting when you say about the people focus i was always thinking of the the fear of conflict but it's even worse because it's the fear of being the source of the conflict, yeah. which is even more guilt tripping. Yeah. And on the other side, you, uh, as you're saying, uh, the, the the fear of being wrong. I was thinking of the fear of being taken advantage of, but to claim that I'm wrong 
or that I, that I did something wrong when I didn't. It's unbelievably unfair. Mm. It's something I learned with uh, when I was studying Paul Ekman's work, because it's one of the main triggers to get people to be very defensive, is accuse them of something they didn't do. Yes. So there's the yeah. example of you got three children, one of them ate some cookies, some biscuits, and you get three children, say one of you ate a biscuit, one of them's got crumbs on his face, and he gives you the duping delight smile, and you go, it's you. No, it isn't me. And then you point the finger and go, and you also ate the chocolate. And they go, no, I didn't. I did not eat the chocolate. Uh -huh. And you see the difference in reaction yeah. between duping delight and legitimate rejection of an unfair accusation. Mm. Uh, but it's interesting with the, the outcome-focused people, indeed, if you take advantage of them or you accuse them of something that's unfair, it's basically taking advantage of them, shifting unfair blame onto them. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah, no, that that would certainly trigger somebody. I mean, if we look at the, the discipline driven, inspiration driven polarity, um, what would what would trigger me if I'm discipline driven is if you take away my sense of order and control. Mm -hmm. um, so on a on a um, on a totally uh, practical basis, if you mess up my space, if you can get somehow control over where I work or where I live and and stop it being ordered in the way that I need to be ordered, that will keep me um, off balance, for yeah. example. That's another sort of cult-type technique. If you can control a, a, a micro detail, everything in people's environment, you'll keep them, you'll keep them triggered. If you go the other way to inspiration-driven, which, as I've said, I'm pretty inspiration-driven, what would trigger me? If you clip my wings if you threaten my freedom that's going to trigger me so um i don't normally like to break rules yeah but if i suddenly feel that the way you're taking me the process the rules you're imposing on me are somehow restricting me i might break out and do something crazy you know? yeah that makes me think of, of of two things first of all the order can be the physical space but also the social environment and one mm. of the things that uh, toxic people and narcissists do frequently and quite well mm. is try to create paranoia in order to create social isolation. Mm -hmm. In other words, your friend there isn't really a friend. They're jealous. They're taking advantage of you. Mm. Or your parents, if they really wanted you to succeed, they do things a bit differently. Mm. And usually there's some element of truth in it. However, yeah. the goal is to create the isolation because when we've got no friends, then all of a sudden we're well, stuck in a one-person cult, as it yes. were. And on the other side, when it comes to the uh, the inspiration-driven, the big picture, something I picked up on often is the look of contempt when you're being, you're sort of on a roll, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, and you get targeted, rejected, with a look of contempt, as in, you went too far, that's ridiculous, that makes you a bad person, what mm -hmm. you just said. D does that make sense? Does it speak to you? Yeah, I think it does. You, what you're talking about is really personalizing it and making the person underneath wrong. You're like you're attacking me at my core. Yeah. You know? Yes, exactly. Um, so with 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 big picture thinking, um, I could have many ideas, but somehow you you attack the ideas in such a way that it's making me wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Or what I've observed is. Instead of attacking the ideas, we disqualify the ideas through ad hominem attacks. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't listen to you because mm -hmm. uh, you don't have the experience, you don't have the knowledge. Yeah, you don't what have you're the doing empathy. there is you're invalidating part of my personality. Yeah. If, if part of who I am is I'm an ideas person, I like to be playful and thoughtful with ideas, but if you can invalidate that part of me, you're, you're cancelling part of me. Uh, that's going to be deeply, deeply distressing. And that's going to cause me, whenever these things happen, we'll overextend. And we might overextend in a completely different area. Mm -hmm. The thing about being triggered is um, my normal personality might be over here. But if you manage to trigger me, I can pop out over here or over here. So I think I described earlier that I'm um, my normal form of overextension is to be too nice myself. Yes. Yeah. I want to show empathy to others and sometimes do that too much. But... I can be in certain circumstances, if a bit like the example you gave, if someone invalidates me or invalidates my perspective, I can suddenly flip. And, and then I'm not looking to smooth the conflict. I'm going to argue with you. And that can be confusing yeah. for other people. But the way we, we don't always overextend in the same way, it mm -hmm. always depends on the, on the context. I'm, I think of the, of the COVID crisis. N normally, I'm pretty engaged and more extroverted. There mm -hmm. was something in the COVID crisis. At some point, I felt isolated. And I suddenly was triggered to go 
overextended introversion. I completely retreated, didn't want to talk to people, and yep. so on. So it can be completely out of the normal, uh, out of your normal pattern of overextensions. Yes. Mm. I'm thinking about something else when, you know, when listening to you, which is I've observed on a regular basis that toxic people will trigger people into overextension, but then claim that the overextension is proof of something. Mm -hmm. So I'll accuse you of something unfair. If you react to it, it's proof that I'm right. It's proof mm. that there's something wrong with you. And that can be really unsettling when, on the one hand, we're overextending, and then we're guilt-tripped into being overextending. Yeah. So there's an extra layer of it's that. It's a bit like they've got you on the ropes then. So they've triggered you to overextend, yes. yeah, and now that you've done it, they're going to keep you in that place by accusing you of that of that very thing. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, and then your overextension yeah. is proof that the accusation is right when sometimes mm. it's just it's an unsettling accusation that goes very far yeah and you need to ponder it thinking well you know if there's an element of truth in this i'd like to know because my ego isn't massively inflated and i have mm. blind spots so if i'm listening to you and there is something i need to process it but if i'm processing it then it's proof that it's right and that's uh it's a different lay a different level of uh yeah. of manipulation it's horrible yeah and um, I got a question also, which is, it's easy to conflate, and I've seen it commonly, the outcome-focused people who tend mm. to be quite tough and they're willing to be competitive yes. and quite logical. It can be viewed as being quite cold. So to conflate that with uh, narcissism and toxicity, and sure, to, I, I can understand it. And I feel there's something missing to this. I think it's a false equivalence. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's also a form of projection as well. So somebody could be highly outcome-focused, um, highly competitive, highly logical. They could be good with conflict. They could be good at arguing and debating things. Um, but to therefore then accuse them of being Machiavellian or um, something toxic um, is sort of unfair and unreasonable because... Um, We've all got different personalities, and we can all be triggered and overextended at times. That doesn't make us toxic. Yeah? Yeah. So I think if you did take somebody who was truly Machiavellian and toxic, you will find that they'll be deeply manipulative and cunning mm -hmm. and not worried about other people's losses and so on. And if they did a psychometric, it would show up if they were honest. <laughs> if they're really Machiavellian, they'll hide it. But yeah. if they're being honest, it would show up that they're high outcome focused and overextended in it very much. It would. But that's not the same as saying that everybody who is outcome focused and overextends in it is therefore Machiavellian. It doesn't work the other way around, if yes. that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, a, to me, a key difference is it's possible to be tough with people. Of course. And Often I hear the person's tough, it means they don't care, but tough usually means that we do care. It means that yeah. we see more potential and we think that a bit of conflict is healthy to bring everyone up. Mm. So there's a difference between being tough, as in I'll give you the feedback because I think you can improve, versus I'll give you fake feedback in order to hurt you. It mm. doesn't have to, so there's a, a lack of sincerity and there's also a win lose mindset of, I want to yeah. hurt you, whereas I think the outcome-focused people, the goal isn't to hurt people, it's to say, let's not waste time with noise if we can just give the feedback and make things better. So the way I'd frame this is we've all got personalities, we've all got ways that we like to think and behave, and we can all be triggered, that's like human. But what you're describing here is some people use their personalities unethically some people use the natural raw ingredients they've got with an intention to keep other people you know off balance uh, and manipulative in some way and other people we hope <laughs> uh, are using their personality with a more honorable intention you know, mm -hmm. to, to collaborate to get on with other people and to express themselves authentically without that um, dysfunctional intention uh, to manipulate others. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a, a really interesting distinction between being ethical and, and unethical, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, you know, part of what I like to do in organisations is help people see that distinction and, and choose for being more more ethical and more authentic. I think the the, the point you're saying there of the, the ethical side is very important. Mm. What is the, the ultimate goal? Is it to improve things for everyone or is it to, mm. uh, to gain the upper hand on someone else? Uh, I see often in, in relationships, people get quite confused because the relationship fails, they feel that they failed, but I feel a relationship with a toxic person was designed for failure, as the mm. goal wasn't mutual success, the goal was extraction of resources for as long as possible, and then discard and move on to the next supply. 
Yeah. And just uh, because we, 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 we've been talking for a while now, I'm curious when it comes to the different personality, let's say, uh, types or the different aspects, what could people do in order to, to protect themselves more or to avoid getting manipulated? Would you have any, any tips or tricks for the different, uh, well, different types? I mean, I would actually start with yourself, with self-awareness. So it's hard to see manipulations in other people if you don't know yourself first. And if you are being manipulated, it can be very helpful to esteem yourself and value yourself by starting with, well, who am I? Uh, what is my underlying personality? You know, we can have our personality warped by years in a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah? So it's good to sort of think, well... Who was I originally? <laughs> yeah. If I go back to whenever, 18 years old, before uh, a certain relationship started, what was I like then? What was the essence of who mm. I really am? So mm. I'd always start with who am I and getting a good grounding in that. But then what you're inviting is you need to be able to accurately read other people. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to notice when they're, when they're not just overextended in a normal way this is a systematic you know abusive relationship so it's about being able to notice when that's happening yes yeah um so i mean i think an understanding of who you are and a, an ability to read other people and understand when they're triggering and trying to cause you to overextend is is an incredibly helpful thing to do i'm trying to think what else i would say you're, you're inviting me to say how can you sort of what can you practically do is what you're really asking yeah pretty much i think on the one hand what you're saying is it's really important to understand where do we stand ourselves mm. when we overextend how do we overextend typically what are the symptoms mm. and then let's say somebody who's highly people focused mm. and will overextend on that side are there any tips that you would suggest to be able to 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 maintain a bit of control or any any way they can rebalance the different energies or dial something up or dial something down i mean if you are aware it's it's happening if you mm. are aware the other person is dysfunctional you know they're toxic um <clears throat> you you somehow need to affirm to yourself that 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 is what they're doing and not let it in to impact you as much yeah. um so that's sort of being aware of the different let's say the four different archetypes of manipulation somebody else can do yeah four different reactions like our arch archetypical reactions we can have mm. then if we're having the reaction pay attention to the behavior that's coming on the other side and if that starts matching then maybe hit the pause button mm. observe the dynamic take a step back and it could actually just be uh, now that i think of it just say something like um, I'm going to need a while to think about that. You might have a point. I mean, that would be a practical thing. What detaching, I think, is the thing to do. If I'm aware someone is trying to trigger me, yeah, um, and in the past have triggered me, mm -hmm. the most useful thing to do is some way of disassociating, yes, so that they don't trigger me um, anymore. It can be naming what they're doing, so you, yes. you're letting them know that you can see the game that's being played. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if yep. that's dangerous name it in your head but at the end of the day there needs to be a way either detaching or disassociating from the circumstance i mean ultimately if it really is toxic you need to get out of that relationship yes and i know that's easier said than done that's yeah. true it's, it's something i've noticed actually having people just ask the question like mm. what are you doing mm. or wh wh why are you saying that what's going on here mm. um and sometimes i remember being in the situation where i'd name what was happening and I'd see that the rage on the other side just become mm. a smirk. And that I, it took me decades to understand what was happening. But just have the smirk of, you know, I, I got you going there, finally. Yes. And I didn't realize a game, sort of game of cat, uh, cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. But I think indeed, name, like you say, either naming verbally, orally, or just in our head. And if mm -hmm. we realize something weird is happening in our head, shut down, go uh, gray stone, gray rock, yeah. disengage quickly, uh, create space. Um, and it's a weird thing because then there's a likelihood they project of saying you're, you're, you're closing me off emotionally. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's okay to close off emotionally and get a bit of space if we need a bit of space. Yeah. 
So that can be a bit unsettling where they, they project onto us the things that they would do so we don't do it. But if we need space, a bit of breathing space, then it's only healthy to take that. I mean, one one technique that um, I sometimes advocate uh, draws on a little bit of cognitive behavioural therapy um, or rational emotive behavioural yeah. therapy. And the, the gist of it is you don't let lies get inside your head. So often when people are manipulating, they're asserting things as true, yes. and you're absorbing them as true. And actually, if you really thought about about it, they're really, really not. Yes. So the idea that um, if somebody asserts something, you take a moment to think, is that actually true, or is it not true? Or do we just not know? So um, you, you might find yourself, if someone says something quite extreme and asserts it as a truth, you could simply say, I'm, uh, let me think about that. You're saying whatever. Let me think. I'm not sure if that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I'm not sure if that would really stand up. And what you're doing is you're not letting in false beliefs because they're often trying to put false beliefs yes. inside your head. That's very true. Um, Another thing that you can do is after the event, if it has happened, Mm -hmm. you can process the dialogue you've had with someone that's been doing this to you. You can write down. I often find if you write down the things that people have said, their absurdity becomes really clear. In the moment, if you're high in empathy, you're not processing them rationally. Mm -hmm. You're in the dialogue trying to smooth the conflict. But if afterwards you write down some of the key things that were said and then go through it and say, would that stand up in a court of law? If I went to a court of law Mm. and a judge was to look at it, this thing that was said there, this assertion about me putting me down or whatever it might be, would it stand up? If the answer is no, strike it out. And that's a way of strengthening your resolve next time you meet that person to say i'm not taking these things that are not true from you i like I that hope that that makes sense somehow. that's that's a very yeah. it's a very good point uh, mm. on, on many levels one of them is it brings some power back to us so we're not yeah. delegating power away to another person mm-hmm. we can we can reason reason and think through it as in the thing the person is asserting is it humanly possible to know this with absolute certainty yeah or not. If it isn't, well, that's that. You know, it means they're, they're deluding yeah. themselves. If it is possible, why would this person specifically know it? Yes. Does it even make any sense? Like, r- yeah. just the whole big picture framework. And then, you know, would another point of view be acceptable or possible? Mm-hmm. Uh, if this is true, what else is true? And I found, like, uh, there's sometimes debates about, you know, taste, which, you know, band is better or whatever, which is, you know, normally just banter. When someone attacks somebody else because of taste, there's no objective measurement Mm -hmm. to know which artist is better than another. The question doesn't even mean anything. Yeah, I mean, for me, then, it's quite okay to say, is it true, is it not true? Actually, I don't know. And sometimes just saying I don't know is a pretty good antidote as well. Just take the certainty out of it. Um, What what I found that works quite nicely also is to just say i'm confused Mm. you know it sounds like you're saying this Mm. and i'm 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 just confused i need a time to think about it Mm. which can work because it sounds like they are being confusing but we're taking the blame so if they accuse us of being confused we agree yeah i'm i'm confused that's why i need time and Mm. that can buy us a little bit of breathing space to to just think a bit more clearly and disengage. Yeah. Uh, and I think. And you'll, you'll often find people that have, for want of a better term, the gift of the gab and they can um, blush to you and so on. If you actually, in the cold light of day, write down what they've said, it's, it will become very evident. Yes. The, the logical flaws and the nonsense. But in the moment, it's gripping. They, exactly. They know how to get inside your head. That, that's something yeah. I, uh, I noticed when I, was, when I was studying. That Looking back to a lot of the texts we read, it was word salad. But <laughs> yeah. we believed there was something clever yeah. to it in social sciences because it was a professor who wrote it and a famous professor, so they yes. had the clout. So obviously, if I don't understand it, the problem is me, mm. as opposed to it actually doesn't make sense. And a few decades later, I look back at it and I realize it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's, I, I wouldn't be able to describe this mm. in a way that makes sense. I see contradictions in it, but I was too young to understand that. But you're mm. right about can I can I write it down? Can I explain it? If I can't, maybe just take a step back, suspend my judgment, and yeah. admit I can't really make sense of this. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that helps sort of ungaslight ourselves, and that's sort of mm-hmm. the the goal of this. Uh, I think you've given us a lot of 
valuable insight and pointers. This well, thank you for inviting me in. I, 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 I'm hoping that I have. Yep. I'm hoping the idea of linking it to a model of personality and triggers and how we might overextend, I hope that you know, gives another, another angle on what you're looking at with toxic people and how to, how to handle them more effectively. Yes, absolutely. And it's, uh, it, it, it's such a fascinating domain. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of noise here, a lot of confused mm. people, a lot of confusion. I think the more valid the models we have, the clearer we can mm. think, the easier it is for people to make sense of it, reduce the danger in their head, and move on to more important things in yep. life. Uh, so I, yeah, I recommend for the the viewers that you have a look at Luminous Splash. Mm. Um, that will really give you some insight as to where you have specific dominance in terms of personality. So things you do more naturally and things you do less easily. It might show you some vulnerabilities that you have. So give you some ideas of what you could dial up or dial down. Mm. I'll probably be doing more content about this. Please, in the comments, let me know if anything stood out to you, if you have any questions. We probably can have another conversation in the future. We certainly can, yeah. And let us know what questions you have. If any, if you'd like us to dig deep into anything specific, if anything didn't make sense to you, you'd like us to clarify anything. Uh, and as always, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you'd like to see more, please let me know. And uh, Stuart, thank you very much for no, watching Thank us. you. I've enjoyed it too. And thank you to everybody for, for listening to our dialogue. Thank you. Bye.